Dr. Ross Brooks is a recent graduate of the Center for Medical Humanities at Oxford Brooks University. Ross has published sec uh, several articles on queer themes in the history of biology and eugenics in leading history of science, technology, and medicine journals. In June 2019, he acted as contributing editor for the first queer-themed edition of Viewpoint, a magazine of the British Society for the History of Science. He is the recipient of the Stern Student Essay Prize. In his lecture entitled, Elliot Slater, Homosexuality and the Origins of Queer Science, Dr. Brooks outlines how in both the United States and Britain, homosexuality after the Second World War became an object of genetic investigation. He outlines how such investigations were intimately connected to worldwide eugenics movements and the development of human genetics. Thank you very much indeed um, to Chris, um, Brittany, Marius, um, and to all the speakers um, for uh, putting together such a fantastic event and, and for inviting me to be part of it. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, this event and my paper is certainly happening at a very interesting time, um, certainly um, in terms of changing concepts of sexuality and the way that um, medical and uh, uh, biological sciences consider aspects of sex differences, sexualities, sexual behaviours. Um, it is a time of great change, which is of great interest to me, being a bit older, um, having grown up gay in the 1970s and 80s, um, when anything to do with science, biology, biologists was absolute anathema. It was the enemy. Um, the most horrendous um, biological and, and psychological interventions for, for um, gay men such as myself and many others, transvestites, um, uh, uh, trans people. Um, this was the intellectual environment in which I grew up gay within. Um, I've put a few examples here just to show that that has not gone away um, by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly the newspaper article that I've, I've put on this slide um, from the Daily Mail on 16th of July, 1993, shows the kind of um, uh, popular discourse that surrounded notions of, of gay brains and gay genes uh, that were circulating at the time, um, emanating from um, uh, major studies, which I'm sure um, people listening will be uh, familiar with. And the intense political debates um, focused so sharply um, on, on homosexuality, and very often male homosexuality, um, which ignited, um, uh, especially amid the, the, the global unprecedented media furore um, surrounding the British American neuroscientist Simon LeVay's claim, um, originally reported in August 1991, if I remember correctly, of a difference in the structure of the brains of homosexual and heterosexual men. Um, this was followed by the claims of the American geneticist, Dean Hamer, who in July 1993 claimed to have identified a genetic marker of male homosexuality. Um, now, the science of this is very interesting, um, but it's really only part of the story. So you can see um, a huge media for all in which um, gay lives, such as my own, um, and you know, one, it felt like one's very existence was just being debated um, in ways that were often really uh, quite horrifying. And this, this discourse about whether a genetic link to homosexuality and other, other trans bodies, minds and behaviours um, might lead to uh, uh, some kind of uh, biological interventions which um, erase people such as myself um, from the human population still continue to this day. But on the other hand, things are changing by no means ubiquitously. And um, often ways, <laughs> um, a lot of the discourse is, is, is carried on through popular and semi-popular platforms and um, is often highly questionable and, and deeply problematic. But at the same time, there is a very genuine um, sense um, that the, the people who conduct science, biological research, um, LGBTQ plus scientists um, now have platforms to express themselves. 
and do so in the most uh, wonderful and, and um, uh, productive, positive ways. I've just put a few examples here. I won't go through them all, but certainly um, uh, examples of, of um, a new discourse, a newly emerging discourse. And I really say it really is relatively new within my lifetime, within the past few years, how this has um, uh, grown exponentially. Um, from scientists um, having uh, new perspectives on the biology of sex differences and sexual orientation. And so you can see, you can even get a, a, a DNA rainbow pin badge now. I mean, who would buy such a thing as that? The huge, I mean, it really is incredible. I, I think many people perhaps don't, don't understand or, or have um, much knowledge of the, of the, the sheer scale of what is um, variously called queer science, or um, if you look here, there's, there's the psychobiology of sex orientation, no less. Um, it is, is a massive um, uh, uh, set of studies, um, popular and scholarly, um, that, that's grown very much since the 19, early 1990s. Um, it's, it's always staggering to me how the focus, even where there's claims that the, the more um, uh, inclusive approach, the primary focus is on homosexuality. Um, there is simply no science of sexual orientation more generally. Um, it really is a, a science of queer people. And understanding that, understanding why, um, is where uh, historical perspectives um, on all the debates that are happening now and have been for the past couple of decades Historical perspectives on understanding where this has come from, um, I think, are, are absolutely critical importance and why an event such as this is um, so amazing and so important. There is simply no getting away from the fact um, that this so called queer science or uh, psychobiology of sex orientation, um, whatever you want to call it, um, is, is deeply embedded in, in, in eugenics. And I'm sure most people will understand that's not a revelation. That's not something I've come up with. Um, and even if you read um, uh, the works of, of Simon LeVay, for example, in his Queer Science uh, book, he, he approaches um, that issue um, to a certain extent, particularly with his discussion of Gunther Dörner, a German um, neuroendocrinologist who was, who was profoundly influential in establishing um, uh, today's uh, queer science. Um, explicitly in a eugenic context. Um, but there is so much more work for historians to do um, in order to elucidate and what that means and, and, and how this came about. Historically, the pursuit of eugenics has had ambiguous associations with changing concepts of sexual inversion, homosexuality, bisexuality, intersexualities, trans phenomena, and other queer bodies, uh, minds, sexualities, and sexual behaviours. While it is incontrovertibly the case that innumerable eugenicists have treated queer people with disdain and sought atrocious interventions to um, try to eliminate us from the human population, this has not consistently been the case. Elsewhere, many queer people have embraced eugenics, while homosexuality has sometimes been considered a useful eugenic method for limiting reproduction. Exploring the complexities and ambiguities that have long characterized the relationships between eugenics and queer bodies and sexualities is a growing area within historiography and is especially useful for underscoring an important lesson from that historiography. That eugenic theories and practices are largely, if not wholly, matters of uh, mainly elite opinion, prejudice, and politics. Now, my slides are very much geared to point, giving some pointers to this, this historiography and um, some, some um, uh, fantastic, um, enlightening works um, uh, that have been published and, and will uh, be published um, uh, by um, some, some, some brilliant historians. Um, my work to date has looked at the very earliest stages of the, of, of the development of, of modern um, uh, biology. Earlier this year, marking the 150th anniversary of, of Charles Darwin's uh, Descent of Man, um, I, had, um, I, I included some discussion. This is in the uh, Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society, freely, it's on open access, freely um, uh, 
able to be read. And it's very interesting with Darwin, um, when his most um, overt discussion of eugenics is actually occasioned um, at the point in his text where he starts uh, talking or, or avoiding the subject, he, he kind of um, begins to talk about uh, uh, queer bodies, um, uh, not necessarily human, um, but then he, he quickly descends into, into a discussion of eugenics. It's a very interesting um, aspect of his writing. Um, I've also looked, um, as have other historians, at the very early history of genetics, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, the extent to which the first geneticists um, looked to uh, occurrences of intersexualities, transformations of sex, and non-reproductive sexual behaviours um, is, is, is much greater than uh, generally appreciated. Um, certainly, in the Anglo-American world, um, texts by leading uh, American and British eugenicists, um, as well as English translations of continental eugenic texts, um, provided litanies of physical and psychological ailments, which their authors believed could and should be willfully bred out of the human population. Abnormalities of the sex organs um, featured among these, and I've just included an example here, uh, um, by the prominent American eugenicist Charles Benedict Davenport, who placed three pathologies of the reproductive organs, um, among many other pathologies of heredity in his book, Heredity in Relation to Eugenics, um, which was originally published in the United States in 1911, and then in Britain um, in 1912. Although prevailing concepts of uh, sexual inversion and homosexuality at that time were often understood as, um, uh, as sex integrates and might therefore be implicitly included within such categories as hermaphroditism in eugenic discourse, they tended either not to be explicitly referred to in such texts or afforded little attention. In his notorious trait book, um, 1912, uh, Davenport included um, nymphomania, sex immorality and sex perversion within a category labelled constitutional psychopathic state. Um, hermaphroditism was listed elsewhere under the category reproductive system, which carries subdivisions and consisted of numerous other sex-related entries, including um, impotence um, and masturbation. In the second 1919 edition of the work, Davenport elaborated his list of the sexological anomalies that appeared under the banner constitutional psychopathic state to include nymphomania, sex immorality, promiscuity, harlotry, prostitution, there's a long list, um, I won't read them all out, um, but homosexuality is, is there with, with um, sex perversion and fetishism. Um, it seems that these categories have been directly imported with little by way of elucidation, um, probably from late 19th century sexological texts. Um, uh, there's one 1886, which um, really does um, ring with, with uh, Davenport's text, which is Richard von Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis. And it's very interesting that while passionately advocating eugenics in their major works, leading biologists were generally cagey, even more than Davenport, about delineating precisely which characteristics, especially psychological and behavioural, they wanted eliminated from the population, preferring instead to deploy more emotive and vague euphemisms and other such terms such as uh, vice and criminality. But in this way, so-called sexual perversions became eugenicised almost by default. Uh, just to give an example, um, addressing the 74th annual meeting of the British Association in Cambridge in August 1904, William Bateson, one of the very early pioneers um, of, of mentalism and genetics, he spoke of the ability of a competent breeder to breed out several morbid diatheses. He continued, as we have got rid of rabies and pleuropneumonia, so could we exterminate the simpler vices. Well, the remark is vague, but his subsequent sentence strongly suggests that his simpler vices included those which infringed prevailing moral standards. Um, and this is something he repeated um, in a striking eugenic vision, a veritable call to arms, um, that concludes his 1909 book, um, Mendel's Principles of Heredity. And he wrote, some serious physical and mental defects, almost certainly also some morbid diatheses, and some of the forms of vice and criminality 
could be eradicated if society so determined. Well, the section and, and the main part of his book concluded um, thus, genetic knowledge must certainly lead to new conceptions of justice. And it is by no means impossible that in the light of such knowledge, public opinion will welcome measures likely to do more for the extinction of the criminal and degenerate than has been accomplished by ages of penal enactment. Well, criminals and degenerates came in many forms um, in, in Edwardian Britain, uh, but for many, homosexuals were chief among them. Um, to jump ahead, um, again, just to, just to offer some pointers of, of some fantastic work that, that, that has been done on, on um, queer aspects of, of the history of, of eugenics and the history of biology. Um, uh, again, I'm sure this is something that many people listening will be familiar with, um, that the specific issue of homosexuality um, emerged as a leading concern of Nazi eugenicists and their interlocutors um, through the interwar period, um, largely through the pursuit of twin studies, um, a highly problematic method of determining genetic traits um, initially developed by um, uh, Francis Galton in the 1870s, the so-called father of eugenics. Historian Garland E. Allen um, has previously discussed how homosexuality became established as an object of eugenically infused twin studies in the United States uh, through the immediate post-war era, um, largely through the interventions of the German emigre psychiatrist and eugenicist Franz Joseph Kalman. Um, Allen describes how Kalman was a student of the Swiss-born um, uh, German psychiatrist, geneticist, and, and Nazi racial hygienist um, Ernst Rudan. Um, and in collaboration with his uh, brother-in-law and architect of Nazi racial hygiene, um, Alfred Plutz, Rudan uh, co-founded the German Society for Racial Hygiene as a member of a, a committee on racial hygiene headed by Heinrich Himmler. And this played a major role in drafting the German sterilization law for psychiatric patients, uh, which were promulgated with, with murderous results um, in July 1933. Following uh, the earlier example of, of Galton, um, Kalman developed the use of twin studies um, in an effort to identify familial um, lineages of schizophrenia, suicide, and other psychiatric conditions um, urging that the Nazi, the Nazi program of forcibly sterilizing patients be extended to their family members who exhibited, and I quote, minor anomalies, um, but were not otherwise unaffected. Nonetheless, Kalman's uh, Jewish ancestry compelled him to leave Germany for the United States in 1935, where he pursued a prestigious career within the, um, the New York State Psychiatric Institute at Columbia University. And he was its director from 1955. And he was a co-founder of the American Society of Human Genetics. The irony of his persecution appears to have had little impact on his approach um, towards the genetics of psychiatry. Um, he remained a committed eugenicist and is a very important figure in the continuity of eugenics um, in, in the post-1945, um, post-war West. Beginning in 1947, Kalman began to compare monozygotic with dizygotic twin subjects and other family relationships for concordance for homosexuality. Kalman's studies remained anchored in Nazi genetic and eugenic psychiatry, which had situated homosexuality ipso facto as a psychiatric condition on par with schizophrenia. And as Alan shows in his, his article um, about Kalman, um, it, it, it's, it's an assumption that forms the basis of this study, um, but has no um, elucidation in and of itself. Um, it's um, a, the path of, uh, a pathological rendering of, of, of um, homosexuality is, is just simply assumed. The subjects of his twin studies were uh, drawn from psychiatric, correctional and charitable institutions in New York. And also, and I quote, through direct contact with the clandestine homosexual world. He reported a remarkable concordance, um, reporting a 100% concordance rate for homosexuality among the monozygotic twin pairs, i.e. both twins were homosexual. And just over 60% concordance for the dizygotic twins 
Um, he ended his major studies. There's two major studies um, that he published um, in, in American medical journals. One was the um, Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, the other the American Journal of Human Genetics. Um, he always ended with, with pleas for more funds and, and, and um, continued to study on genetic aspects of homosexuality, an endeavour he considered to be pressing. For example, in the German, uh, sorry, for example, in the American Journal of Human Genetics, he wrote, the urgency of such work is undeniable as long as this aberrant type of behavior continues to be an inexhaustible source of unhappiness, discontentment, and a distorted sense of human values. His work on, on homosexuality was, was enormously influential. Um, even as it was profoundly influenced by his, his eugenic um, agenda and, and um, influenced other eugenicists. So I just want to move on now on to my own research, um, which I've been pursuing, um, concerning the prominent English psychiatrist um, and eugenicist Elliot Slater, himself associated with Nazi psychiatrists. Slater firmly established homosexuality as an object of study within British neuropsychiatry, widening the formative focus on twin studies to include personality testing, as well as studies of maternal age, SIBs, and birth order. And anyone who is familiar um, with what, what um, Simon Lay calls queer science or the psychobiology of, of um, sex orientation today, we'll, we'll start to see how, how that takes shape, because these are the kind of studies that are still pursued um, in terms of, of um, pertaining to human sexuality. And it is with Slater that things start to become quite familiar. But again, his, as with Kalman, his unquestioning assumption that homosexuality was per se a pathological condition um, underlies most of his work. But as I do want to show, it was not accepted by all his contemporaries. Um, but even in that situation, he, he shaped the development of queer science as it was subsequently pursued in Britain and, and elsewhere. The subject of homosexuality with Slater and others, fully emerged as a serious concern of, of um, certain British psychiatrists and their interlocutors only through the late 1940s and early 1950s. And this is really important uh, because this is precisely the time, and this is not a coincidence, when calls for reform of the law relating to gay sex began to gain pace. Such calls and the sensational reporting of legal uh, cases concerning gross indecency, um, as homosexual relations between men were turned in law, British law, um, involving well-known public figures and aristocrats, um, eventually led to the convening of the Home Office's historic departmental committee on homosexual offences and prostitution in August 1954. Now, the committee's famous 1957 report, commonly known as the Wolfenden Report, after its um, the chairperson, John Wolfenden, uh, recommended the partial legalisation of male homosexual acts, as well as establishing an age of consent for males as already existed in law for females. And these recommendations were eventually realised by the Sexual Offences Act 1967. Much of the intense debates that surrounded the subject of homosexuality in post-war Britain um, centred on medical and scientific models of sexualities. Highly contested and almost comically contradictory when viewed together, uh, such models were increasingly challenged by growing recognition that homosexuality in and of itself was a natural variation of human sexuality. The notion, uh, little expressed in Britain before 1945, gained ground, um, especially following the sensational publication um, in the uh, United States and Britain globally of um, sexual behaviour in the human male in 1948 and sexual behaviour in the human female in 1953, uh, together known as the Kinsey Report, um, after its, its main author, the famous American zoologist and sexologist Alfred C. Kinsey and his associates. The Kinsey Report was enormously influential, but its findings of the high prevalence of homosexual behavior among Americans, its occurrence in non-human animals, and Kinsey's insistence upon its normality also prompted some vicious responses. And the period of the Kinsey Report's publication 
and global reception also, also witnessed um, a, a punitive um, intensification of pathological models of homosexuality and queer sexualities and bodies and behaviours more generally, um, including the development of supposed therapies, so-called so gay cures. Um, it really is a very interesting um, that these really become intensified in Britain um, only following um, ever louder calls for reform of the law um, and new ways of looking at um, homosexuality as normal and natural. Um, most significantly, Kalman's work on homosexuality and his ideological and rhetorical approach more generally, um, and his eugenics and eugenic founding and the grounding of his studies on homosexuality, was echoed by, by Elliot Slater, who was a specialist in the genetics of mental disorders. Um, he was editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and vice chair of the Eugenic Society uh, between 1963 and 1966. Slater's checkered ideological and professional credentials um, are well known um, to certain historians. Um, and in 1934, as a young medical officer at London's Maudsley Hospital, um, he visited Munich uh, to study psychiatric genetics with Ernst um, Thrudan and his associates um, at the German Research Institute for Psychiatry. Now, of course, the, the, the um, Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry, um, supported by a travelling fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation. Slater visited other Nazi-run psychiatric institutions in Germany, Austria, Denmark and Sweden, and again visited Rudan's Institute in 1937. The notoriously um, equivocal article on German eugenics in practice, um, published in the Eugenics Review in January 1936, reflected dispassionately on the first year of compulsory sterilization in Nazi Germany. Despite his later protestations and repudiations of Nazism, Slater was ambiguous about his commitment to eugenics, and he remained a, um, uh, uh, um, explicitly committed to his acquaintances um, uh, his, his, uh, in, in Nazi Germany um, throughout his career. And his caginess about eugenics has often been reflected in scholarship about him and his work. Um, a, a hagiographic appraisal was published in 1996, and collections of his publications are highly selective. Um, his commitment to eugenics, as well as the influence of Kalman, um, is clearly apparent in his writings on homosexuality that were and remain enormously influential. Slater was responsible for rendering much of the relevant German literature on the subject um, in English through his own studies and writings, um, uh, several of which concerned homosexuality. So, for example, from 1944, he made various reports um, about genetic studies of um, uh, German genetic studies of, of homosexuality uh, for the Journal of Mental Science. Um, the British Journal of Psychiatry changed, changed its name um, and elsewhere. He further perpetuated um, pathological, psychiatric, um, genetic ideology and studies of homosexuality in his major publications, um, which have um, such works as Psychotic and Neurotic Illnesses in Twins, 1953, uh, Clinical Psychiatry, and The Genetics of Mental Disorders. Um, that there's various others. Uh, there's another one, an introduction to physical methods of treatment in psychiatry, um, where he, 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 he briefly comments um, on the fact that he, he was uh, um, involved in, in operations, um, lobotomy operations on, on, on uh, queer men. Along with his statistician brother, Patrick Slater, Elliot Slater um, applied a new test in an attempt to assess homosexual traits, as he called them. Although it used a psychological measure, the Slaters were clear that, in their view, the psychological measure would accurately reflect an underlying constitutional genetic condition. In their words, good grounds are to be found in genetical theory for expecting that psychological traits which differentiate men from women would also differentiate constitutionally different types of men from one another. But at this point of time, Slater was, was giving credence to a, a long outdated um, genetic theory of sex differentiation, whereby sex, differentiate, uh, sex differences 
were considered quantitatively um, rather than as the sharply qualitative one that was commonly considered. Psychological traits, the Slaters believed, um, reflected this underlying corporeal masculinity um, or femininity in all its gradations and a profoundly gendered psychological test, they believed, could act therefore as a useful measure of intra-sex differences, um, as well as differences between males and females. Um, so in this scenario, um, homosexuality was taken as a measure of an underlying genetic femininity in men and masculinity in women. Um, although the state has made no study of lesbians um, or bisexuals, their joint study on homosexuality was published in the British Journal of Medical Psychology in March 1947, again, precisely when debates about homosexuality um, uh, 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 are beginning to um, uh, rage in an unprecedented uh, volume in, in Britain's newspapers and elsewhere. Um, and the desirability of law reform um, was being debated um, in, in Parliament, um, in intellectual journals, um, and as I say, in um, in newspapers, but in that article, the Slaters stated that the origins of their tests dated back to the publication um, of a book called um, Sex and Personality, Studies in Masculinity and Femininity, published in 1936 um, by American psychologists, uh, Lewis M. Terman and Catherine Cox Miles. And this promulgated an experimental analysis of masculinity and femininity through the use of highly gendered personality testing. Around that time, in 1937, Patrick Slater was engaged as a research psychologist um, at the Institute for the Scientific Treatment of Delinquency, um, now the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, where numerous sex offenders were sent for medical treatment. The Slaters wrote, many of the delinquents referred to this clinic, um, even if they were not overt homosexuals, were charged with offences into which a homosexual component might have entered. Whilst they thought that Terman and, and Miles's um, test might have some use in such cases, the Slaters considered it too long, expensive and cumbersome. Um, they also most interestingly recognised its cultural specificity, um, specificity, that it contained numerous items um, that were um, obviously topical to the United States, that's their term. They also recognised that if respondents knew what the test was for, they might easily fake their responses. The basis for their alternative tests um, was initially suggested by the occupational psychologist Mary B. Stott, who, while developing vocabulary tests, noted that some words were more familiar to children of one sex than the other of the same mental age, their term. Stott's suggestion led to the development of Patrick Slater's Selective Vocabulary Test, um, initially published in 1944. Um, this test um, comprises of lists of words of which subjects um, are asked the meaning. As an exercise in gender stereotyping, this test is, is, is truly astonishing. Um, so, for example, words listed as being associated with dressmaking, such as bobbin, crochet or haberdashery, were, according to the Slaters, better known to girls than boys. In their logic, recognition of these words by boys was therefore taken as an indication of a genetic homosexual trait, not erudition. Well, in their joint study, the Slaters applied the vocabulary tests um, uh, to a group of 37 homosexual men who had been referred to the neurological wing of the Sutton EMS Hospital for treatment. Their results were compared to those of a group of 50 normal men. Um, a short pressure of their case studies, along with their test scores, were published in a lengthy table. And from the results, the state has um, determined that the group was significantly more um, heterogeneous than normal men, a result they viewed as supporting um, the model, this model of genetic sex that allowed for degrees of constitutional and psychological overlap between the sexes. The state has wrote, the more we magnify the no man's land between the sexes, the more diversified we may expect the behaviour to appear to those whose spiritual home is there. And this appears to be what has happened. We have developed an instrument for observing the differences between the sexes in psychological terms. 
Well, like most of Eliot Slater's innovations in, in, in the medico scientific study of homosexuality, um, his use of, of vocabulary tests was, was enormously influential, um, especially in Britain. And as late as 1984, it was used in a study of trans individuals, referred to as transsexuals at the time, at the University of Manchester's Department of Psychiatry. His peculiar view that homosexuality should be considered and medically treated as pathological, um, despite simultaneously arguing that it was produced uh, from the natural distribution of genes in humans, um, was not universally shared by other psychiatrists. So I'd just like to discuss um, a single text. Um, the literature is, is, is large and complicated, but I, I think I can demonstrate this just through the use of, of one single document, which is um, a very insightful text from 1955. And it shows just how complex, varied, um, and, and, and um, often contradictory attitudes towards homosexuality were in post-war British psychiatry. In that year, a special committee of the Council of the British Medical Association produced a major report on homosexuality, uh, which was published in December 1955, um, and it was also pressed in, in, in the British Medical Journal. Um, and the purpose of this document really was to be submitted as expert evidence to the Wolfenden Committee. The wide-ranging reports um, includes a chapter titled um, Etiological Factors, which was subdivided into various categories, um, such as uh, the, the case for a genetic basis, endocrine factors, and early and later environmental influences, with specialists in each area asked to contribute. Slater contributed to the section, The Case for a Genetic Basis, um, along with the English psychiatrist and eugenicist, um, Lionel Sharples Penrose, um, another very influential um, uh, genetic, uh, psychiatrist who was influential in, in establishing a, a particularly genetic psychiatry. He was also Goldson Professor of Eugenics between 1945 and 1965, and Professor of Human Genetics between 1963 and 1965, at University College London. As its header suggests by the epithets, the case for, Penrose and Sater were cautious and indeed equivocal in their claims. The report stating that it must be admitted, however, that the case for a genetic basis is not acceptable to all observers. Homosexuality, the text argues, was an unsuitable trait for precise genetical study, as it was so complex. Still, suggestive evidence from studies of familial incidents of psychopathology, i.e. common studies, I guess, and from various published studies, um, also the Kinsey reports, um, were outlined. Um, both Penrose and Slater appear to have agreed that the evidence especially from the twin studies, suggested, and I quote, that certain genes lay down a potentiality which, in average circumstances, will lead to homosexuality in the person who possesses them. Still, a difference in basic interpretation between the two psychiatrists is discernible in the final paragraph of the section. It begins, the evidence summarised in the preceding paragraphs tends, in Dr Slater's opinion, to support the view that there is a small proportion of the population who are so constituted, perhaps in large part by genetical causes, as to be unable to form heterosexual, normal heterosexual relationships and to be strongly predisposed to form homosexual ones. The remainder of the paragraph outlines Penrose's conclusion, which is decidedly different in tone and argument to the preceding sentence, and this was apparently not endorsed by Slater. Penrose wrote, Professor Penrose thinks that variations in sexual polar polarity might be regarded as a perfectly normal trait, comparable with variation in stature, hair pigmentation, handedness, or visual refractive error. These traits are all probably dependent upon interaction between heredity and environment, and the variation within all of them, Penrose believes to be probably of degree rather than of kind. He therefore concludes that in the great majority of cases of homosexuality, the condition is not abnormal, but an example of a natural and probably inevitable type of biological variation. Well, Penrose's position outlined 
outlined here definitely shows that, that um, pathological interpretations of, of data, um, the data is, is not in dispute, it's uh, a matter of opinion um, produced by biological investigations um, were by no means pervasive through the 1940s and 50s, um, even among committed eugenicists and advocates of genetic psychiatry, and were routinely contradicted by alternative narratives of normalization um, and naturalization. Slater, however, was undeterred, and he continued to pursue methods of detecting and measuring what he unerringly believed to be a genetic um, uh, uh, basis for homosexuality in pathological terms, um, developing methods that were subsequently adopted um, by numerous neuropsychiatrists um, in their pursuit of, of queer science. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to go through his, his later studies. Um, um, I, um, I have published an article already. That there's that's a, 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 um, really just an introduction. There's um, such a large and complex literature. Um, and so really just... By way of concluding, I mean, my, um, my, my key mes message is that, um, I guess, that historical perspectives on, on this very um, large and um, deeply problematic uh, body of, of scientific pursuits, which, which variously called uh, queer science, psychobiology of sex orientation, um, really are much needed. Um, and it, I think that's a process that, that uh, should be ongoing. I think responsibility for the history of, of the, um, um, for, for queer dimensions of the history of eugenics, history of, um, of biology is, is something that you can't just draw a line in the sand and say, oh, well, we've done that, that's the past. I think the, the responsibility and the need um, to keep um, producing new histories in order to understand where we're at at the moment. Um, because there is so much more to do, and I'm reluctant to draw any, any grand conclusions. Um, but the one I think that is, that is very important is um, coming back to something I, I, I alluded to at the, the beginning of my talk, which is that this, this is not astonishing. It is, this, this body of work it is not a science of sexual orientation. Um, it seems that, I mean, perhaps people listening might be able to correct me, perhaps there's, there's now a straight gene out there. The, 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 the cultural needs to have um, a kind of a genetic explanation for heterosexuality um, uh, just doesn't seem to exist. Again, it's this, the assumptions um, that have um, produced a very specifically queer science with homosexuals um, and trans people as, as, as objects of, of a specific inquiry. Um, this has such deep origins within the history of eugenics. Um, so I hope I've made some, um, uh, some points clear. Um, I've already given some indication of, of what is a growing scholarship, a growing historiography, um, which uh, very much complements the science that is now happening today. And so my final slide is just a few more um, absolutely fantastic works. Um, some, by some brilliant um, historians, by no means all included here. Um, wonderful work being done by um, uh, Beans Veloci uh, in uh, Yale at the moment. Um, um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, I will be able to get a book out, um, not in the near future, but certainly looking ahead. Thank you once again um, uh, to Chris, to Brittany, to everyone concerned. Um, huge thanks to Marius Turda, who has supported me in my research. Um, uh, unerringly um, for, for so many years. Um, I really could not have done it. Um, I would not be doing it without his support. So thank you, Marius.